Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We have a, uh, a kind of an early start because we have a lot on our agenda, so we'll go ahead and, and get, uh, call to order the Mesa City Council meeting for the afternoon of Monday, July the 11th. Uh, I believe a moment ago we had Mr. All of our council is present. I'll note, with the exception of Mr. Freeman, who was, uh, I believe, or, and planning on him participating virtually. But I, uh, he, I think he might not be on the call right now. Mr. Freeman, are you with us? All right. Well, uh, I think his intention is to join us, and I think he might have been with us a moment ago. So we'll we'll see uh, when he joins us. Uh, first item on our agenda, item one, is to review the agenda for tonight's regular council meeting. Again, I know we went through this on Tuesday, so I think a lot of the, our questions were answered there. But council, any questions regarding tonight's agenda or any additional information you'd like from staff? Mr. Thompson. I did. I was just, I'm actually looking for it now. I saw it last night and reminded myself to ask about it. It was, I think it was actually in Frankie's district. It was... Um, It was, a, it was one of the projects at Country Club and just to the west of Country Club, north of the 60. And uh, I was as uh, the reason it caught my eye was because it was, it's zoned as LC and it's being, um, it's coming to us for approval for multifamily. So I was gonna make sure that the council was okay um, taking away employment for Multifamily, because I know we had talked several times in the past about which one was it? Seven, yeah, seven B. Seven B. Yeah, item seven B, because I know that we had talked district not only or is district four. I'm yeah. sorry, because um, we had talked in the past on council and especially in our strategic planning session about not being a, a rooftop community, and and we'd had several conversations in the past talking about um, employment. And this is again taking employment, and turning it into residential. So I just want to make sure the council's okay with moving this forward, because um, I see that it was approved by P and Z, 5-0, but it just caught my eye. Not my district. So if the council members okay with it, then I'm cool with it too. But thought I would ask. Looks like it's less than an acre, and it's uh, it's just a fourplex. In a kind of an infill, the project it looks like. Mayor Councilmember um, Thompson, that's correct. So it's it's about three lots west of Country Club, and it's a small parcel that has just a little vacant office building on it. It's adjacent to another RM4 property to the west, so it is just kind of an infill, infill small townhome development. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions on that item? Other uh, questions for tonight's agenda? Um, I, think, you know, I, have a for... <laughs> I should know the 11A. 11A. Thank you. I know there's been ongoing discussions, correct? Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. So as you may recollect, we've had several discussions with the community and the neighbors on this project. And just to remind you, just to refresh your memory, this is a rezoning from residential nine to residential medium three to allow 36 units. Um, previously, the request was for 40 units, and I'll go through quickly to just refresh your memory. So the location of the property is south of Southern Avenue and west of 32nd Street, as you can see here. This is the side pictures that we took. Um, to the west of the property is actually um, an office building. And just across the street is the residential neighborhood. This is again looking east from 32nd. You can see this is well-established residential neighborhood. And this is looking west. This is the Paso. This is Southern Avenue and 32nd Street. 
So the general plan character designation on the property is neighborhood suburban. And why this is really important is when the voters approved the general plan back in 2014, one of the standards that was created or one of the criteria for reviewing such zoning designation or change is in situations where you have a property that is um, adjacent to an arterial street the general plan highly recommends such uses to create high density residential to really serve as a buffer between your single family and that's really also a typical good planning principle so if you look at this site it's really at the corner of an arterial intersection and also as part of the neighborhood character designation one of the characteristics of the neighborhood character designation is to provide variety of housing types, which includes multifamily as well. So this is the site plan that was presented to the Planning and Zoning Board. And at the time of the PNZ review, the proposed units were 40 units. When it went to PNZ, or right before the day of hearing, staff received Com um, communication from the community expressing their opposition and some of the issues that we've dealt or as I will go through the presentation was the neighborhood was not aware. That's why majority did not show up at the PNZ to really oppose a request. Um, and also few standards that were associated with the site plan that was approved by PNZ the 40 units that was presented to the Planning and Zoning Board required um, 84 parking spaces with a parking ratio of 2.1. At the time of the PNZ review, the applicant had provided 90 parking spaces, which was six more than what was required. In addition to the parking spaces, there was also an included dog park that was part of the site plan and there were other number of setback reductions. And there was also a uh, pool area and playground amenity. After the PNZ, we were notified by several neighbor, neighbors of their opposition. So through that, we went through several neighborhood meetings and discussions with the neighbors, which has taken almost um, four months, if not more, um, after that. And so through that discussion, there's been several revisions to the site plan. One was to increase the parking, and I'll go through that. And then also to um, change some of the setback reduction to really meet the current zoning, the requested zoning setbacks. And also to remove the dog park. As you know, right across the street, the city has a park there that has a, um, a dog park as well. So the revised site plan, which is what you'll be considering tonight, is proposing 36 um, units. And with that, the required parking at a ratio of 2.1 is 76 parking spaces. However, the applicant is proposing 108 parking spaces, which is um, 32 additional parking spaces from what is really required. And, this was one of the major discussions and conversations with the neighbors because they were concerned about overflow parking from the development going onto the streets and all that. So there's been a lengthy discussion and most of the parking standards and how they're going to ensure that the residents also park on the property is actually addressing the good neighbor policy, which is going to be recorded as part of the uh, CCNRs. And I'll go through that briefly when I get there. One other issue that the neighbors had was the requested park um, setback reduction. So they basically requested and discussed with the um, applicant to, re to go back to the required setbacks that is required as part of the requested zoning and um, to also maintain the amenities that was uh, part of the initial request. Another major discussion or issue that came up was the elevations. The elevations that were reviewed by Design Review Board and Planning and Zoning Board, the neighbors believed that those elevations was not compatible to the neighborhood. They were out of place. 
So as part of the various discussions, um, the applicant revised the elevations, and this is the current elevations that you're looking at. That includes some pitch roof in a way, and um, kind of modification. This is, again, you're looking at the revised elevations. And again, you're looking at the revised ele elevations as well. I think this is looking at the corner from Southern and 32nd Avenue. Um, the applicant mail letters to 500 people, um, property owners within 500 feet, and this was one of the contention that really came up because in the project narrative, the applicant had indicated or there was some indication that people that were notified were outside the 500. That was not the case. However, after that, there's been all these neighborhood meetings that has really extensively engaged every possible neighbor that had um, that has interest on the development. Since these are some of the pictures that you can see um, from the neighborhood meetings that we attended. Um, and then, as you can see, one of the things is the parking keep changing. So just to be clear, the applicant is providing 32 additional parking spaces, not 18, because initially it was 18, and then finally they keep changing the plan. So right now, the plan that you'll be considering is going to approve 32 additional parking spaces from what is required. In addition to the discussions, this is the good neighbor policy. These are the things that the good neighbor policy is going to be addressing. One is to ensure that the residents are notified not to park on the street, and then the manager for the development will ensure through other things incorporated into the CCNR to make sure that people park in the garages and not you know, on the streets or outside the require, I mean, their own garages. And they will also direct their um, visitors to also park in, within the development. One other key issue that really drew on for a while was the neighbors wanted to make sure that the good neighbor policy is enforceable because, as you know, the good neighbor policy has to be enforced by the developer. And so they wanted to ensure that it's recorded as part of the CCNRs. And that was one of the things they went back and forth. And then another key issue was to ensure that whenever there is any changes to the good neighbor policy, the property owners within certain radios are notified. And so that had to be incorporated into the CCNRs. If they want to change some of the critical issues like parking and all that, that is, they are really notified. So there's been several meetings. We've been part of the conversation. We met with the developers on Thursday or Tuesday of last week and really was able to help guide them to be very specific and true that it looks like they um, been able to come to an agreement. So as I'm talking this morning, I spoke to both the developer's attorney, which I believe is going to be here tonight, and I also spoke to one of the leaders of the community, and there was an email exchange that a couple of the council members were also copying on that. Based on where we are today, more of the issues that were discussed has been agreed on. That's what I was told, and I'm sure if it's not, we may get somebody from the community coming to express that. But my understanding from my conversation with both the attorney and the um, one of the leaders is all the things that were discussed, there's been an agreement on that. Um, so having said that, one of the things that the council should be aware, we have not received an actual withdrawal of the petition that requires supermajority vote of the council. Um, we've communicated with them. I think the attorney also has communicated with them that if all the issues has been re um, resolved, then hopefully we expect either, either an email or somebody to show up to say that. But as of now, we haven't seen that. But I can say that from our conversation, it looks like all the issues have been resolved. But it's still in effect. It's still in effect. That's correct. So, so it takes five votes to approve it tonight. Okay. So Thank based you. on the findings, um, the proposed request staff is recommending approval because it's in conformance with the general plan and um, the criteria for approving a PAD. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I know this is um, the 
Council Member Spilsbury and, and City staff have invested a lot of time, and, and I know that the neighborhood's been very interested and involved. So it, it's frankly, I, I, it's been fun for me to watch this process uh, come together. More fun for me than I'm sure it's been for, <laughs> so for members of staff and for the council member. But uh, I, I find this all very encouraging. Council member? I'll just save my comments for upstairs since okay. we're going to actually sure. do the vote up there. But is that all right? You bet. Any other questions on this zoning case that's off our consent agenda and will be heard tonight? I do have one question. I should have thought it, about it earlier. So in the good, good neighbor policy, it's required that the residents park in the garage the, of their unit? Mayor, yeah, Council, that's correct. The good neighbor policy and the CCN house requires the residents to park their vehicles in the garage and also to make sure that they don't really stack their garages with things to basically take room where they wouldn't be able to park their vehicles. I see some of these are three bedroom plus a bonus room. So if there was three cars, are, what happens? Mayor, Council, one of the things we, did, we had this discussion with the CCNR is, is the responsibility of the property management to really look at when you're going to rent to see if you have more than required vehicles that you will not be able to park on the property. And that's really common to most apartments when you're going to rent and they have the CCNR. They ask you this because you need to register your vehicles so they will make sure that you don't have three cars when you only can park them, two of them. In addition, um, that, that will be some of the management practices that they have to put in place. Okay, so, all right. Um, yeah, so if you have teenagers and they come of age and you get a car, then they would just need to move out, is that right? Yeah, they wouldn't okay. be able to rent here according to that. Okay, interesting, thank you. Any other questions regarding this matter or anything else on tonight's agenda? So, I don't know, Rachel, do you want to mention 6B or rescheduling 6B, is that correct? That is correct. So we're going to be continuing that item and introducing that on August 22nd. Okay. 6B. So will we just be... Remove it. We'll just remove it from yet. the agenda. Okay. So we don't have a date certain, so we'll just remove it. All right. You got that, Kevin? We're removing 6B? Okay. Uh, Mayor? Yes, Mr. Freeman. This is the voice from wherever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to remove 7A, and we'll have a separate vote on that upstairs. 7A. All right. So 7A is off of the consent agenda. Got that, Kevin? Thank you. Okay. Council, any other questions on tonight's meeting? All right, thank you. We do have uh, several items for this meeting. Uh, item 2A is a pre presentation to provide direction on the proposed audit plan for fiscal year 22-23. Good to have our city attorney or city auditor, uh, Joe Listano. Lo Joe Lissitano, excuse me, Joe. Hi, Mayor Council, I'm Joe Satano, the City Auditor, and just going to go over the audit plan for this year and just kind of four key things that we do. Um, so what we currently have in progress, our audits planned for next year, or this year now, uh, the follow-up reviews we have due for this year, and then the other activities that our department um, conducts. So currently we have these audits in process. Um, the first is the Mesa Tennis Center. Uh, revenues, um, which is an audit just looking at the revenues, making sure their policies and procedures in place are um, appropriate in order to ensure revenues are properly calculated and recorded. And then the next is the police department's uh, badging and security access. And this is really a citywide audit, but the police department kind of takes ownership of it. And we're just looking at the security of the system and how they um, follow their policies and procedures to activate and deactivate badges and ensure access is secure. 
those first two audits are nearly done, so they'll, they'll be done shortly. Um, the next few audits are kind of in the middle or just beginning uh, of the process. Um, so the first next one is community services, the veterans um, housing program. You know, we're just looking at the policies and procedures in place to ensure that the program is administered in accordance with applicable uh, laws, policies, and any other applicable uh, requirements. The next is the transportation maintenance program, and this is just a, an audit to ensure that the policies and procedures in place for the transportation department uh, ensure that the city streets are main, maintained appropriately. And then the next two audits are with the police department. The first is property and evidence, so we're looking at their um, property and evidence and ensuring they're follow, following all um, applicable laws, policies, statutes to ensure that um, property and evidence is processed correctly. And then the next is the police department's criminal investigations case management. So we're looking at their um, process for monitoring, assigning, and following the appropriate procedures for their uh, criminal investigations cases. For next year, these are the audits we are proposing. So the first is the Department of Innovation and Technology's remote access. And this is to determine if the appropriate controls are in place to ensure risks related to uh, uh, access to the city's network are minimized and connectivity between the network and remote users is secure. Uh, this is a carryover from last year. We didn't quite get to that one this year, so we're going to carry it over to this year. The next audit is the uh, city's um, take-home vehicles, uh, and we're going to be looking at the controls in place to ensure that um, employee use of city-owned vehicles is done in accordance with uh, applicable city policies, statutes, any other requirements. The next audit is, the, uh, is related to the intergovernmental agreements that the city has with other cities, counties, um, any other type of organizations that we have where some sort of cost recovery is involved. Um, so we're going to most likely do a risk assessment because there's too many agreements for us to test all of them and kind of look at what ones have the most risk and look at those and see that we are uh, recovering the costs that the agreements say that we should be. The next audit is the Department of Innovation and Technology Cybersecurity. So we're going to look at the controls in place that would help prevent, deter, and or respond to cyber attacks. The next audit is the hiring and recruitment practices for the Human Resources Department. And what we're going to look at there are industry standards and what the, how the city compares to those and helps us comply with any applicable policy, statutes, any other requirements. And our last audit is the citywide special pay programs, and this is to look at the controls in place to ensure that those are um, administered and approved with, with the applicable city policies. These are the follow-up reviews we have for next year. Um, the first is the business services procurement processes. And, and this was just an audit we did last year where we looked at their processes and procedures in place. And, the department will be will be going back to the department this year to ensure that they've corrected those um, any um, findings that we had during that audit. Uh, the next is the human resources and employee benefits claims administration contract, and we specifically looked at the medical contract. And we did this about two years ago, but we held up on the uh, follow up review because uh, this contract is actually actually coming up for a bid this year. So we want to see that. The, our suggestions that we um, recommended are put into action. The next audit is the Falcon Field, and this is uh, an audit that we did where we looked at the revenues for the um, Falcon Field and uh, ensure that they were, um, you know, recorded and calculated appropriately, and uh, we'll be following up with them this year. Next audit is the Fleet's Parks Management. Same similar audit where we just looked at their policies and procedures to ensure that they're managing their parts appropriately. The next is the Department of Innovation and Technology Software and Application Management. Um, and we'll be going back in and seeing that they made the corrections to our recommendations for their uh, management of those uh, particular um, 
software and applications that we looked at. And then the last follow-up review is our convention centers. Um, this will be the second follow-up for their revenues, um, and it's just ensuring that they're appropriately calculating and recording their revenues in a timely manner. And then these are the other activities that we do. Um, annually, we, we conduct cash handling um, audits, so we go out to the various sites that collect cash, and we just we, we conduct cash counts, make sure that they're following the appropriate procedures. The PCI DSS annual review is a credit card uh, requirement where we look at the sites that take credit cards and ensure that they're following city policies and the policies from this organization that um, sort of sets requirements for uh, credit card um, for any kind of in company that collects, uh, that takes credit cards. So it could be us or you know, another business, but um, we, we have to follow those requirements. Uh, we also manage our fraud and ethics hotline, um, the calls that come into that or um, requests that we get through our uh, online portal, portal as well, and we conduct investigations as necessary. We are available to other departments for consulting, which could be um, guidance on internal controls or limited reviews, financial statement reviews, any kind of thing like that. And then the last is any unscheduled audits that are requested by the city manager or city council. That is our plan for this year. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I know this you, you've met with council members individually, and this was discussed at the audit uh, subcommittee as well. Uh, council, any any questions on this agenda item? I'll just make a comment. If, thank you for your hard work. I know that the work that you've done over this past year, and this looks like an aggressive agenda as well going forward. So thank you for everything that you do. Sure, thank you. We actually do try to overschedule a little bit just to make sure that we have enough work to do. Um, <laughs> but it also helps push the staff a little bit too, right? So. Well, you, I, uh, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal, right? Yeah, it's an ambitious plan. So if there's no further questions, thank you, Joe. Thanks. Appreciate hearing back from you. Uh, item 2B on our agenda is a presentation to provide direction on using coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds to purchase uh, an existing East Mesa Hotel at 6347 East Southern Avenue for the continued operation of the Off the Streets Emergency Housing Program. Lindsay and Kim and Natalie, thank you for all you're doing on this topic. Thank you, Mayor, <clears throat> members of the City Council. Uh, we're here to, tonight to talk to you about the Off the Streets program. And not so much about the program itself, though we will give you a, a quick update there, but to talk about the longevity of the program and continuing it into the long term. We really feel like the program has um, filled a gap in our whole process and it has proven itself to be successful. So we wanted to bring an idea to you for consideration. Um, with me today is Lindsay Belinke. She's our community services deputy director. She also has human services, which is where homeless is now resides. And Kim Fallback, our real estate services administrator. So this is where the Off the Streets program fits within our housing path to recovery. It really is that very first step. It helps to stabilize people. We sort of call it a, a pre-shelter because it helps people get ready to really make a commitment for recovery. Some of the considerations that we took into a long-term approach is we wanted to think about purchasing an asset. And we think that doing that will help us save money over time versus leasing rooms. We also would like to take advantage of using rescue funds um, to purchase this asset. We need these types of rooms and have found this to be critical for us to meet our urban camping laws as we move forward. And we wanna make sure that Mesa, the city council has the ability and the authority to decide about this program and its continuation no matter what is happening. So those are some of the things that we did to bring forward this recommendation today. Hello, Mayor and Council. It's nice to be here in this new capacity and I'm excited to be part of this work. I just wanted to remind everyone of our current program and give you a few statistical updates. Um, so we do have the current emergency shelter where we rent hotel rooms currently. And in 
since May 2020, when we started the program, we have served 777 individuals. And that's through May of this year, 2022. And of those, 74% successfully have transitioned out of that shelter. And almost 20% of those are children that we serve. And 13% are seniors over the age of 62. We do, at this location, provide priority to our police officers and park rangers that are out doing the work and, and really um, talking to people on the streets and in parks, as well as our community court and Mesa's most vulnerable, which includes our elderly, disabled, and women with small children. And this really also helps us to address the urban camping laws um, to make beds available to those in need, as well as really supports our first responders in being able to be a point of referral rather than a social worker on the street. We lease this hotel space for approximately $1.75 million per year, and we have currently 85 rooms, as well as 15 beds that is in a congregate space that allows us to serve more individuals. We do allow um, for pets um, in a small capacity and operation space in the hotel, as well as str a strong on-site security as our core element. Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm here to talk to you about the proposed property. It's the Sleep Inn, located at 6347 East Southern Avenue. It's near Superstition Springs Mall. It was built in 1996. It's a three-story, 84-room uh, building, about 31,000 square feet on 1.5 acres. It does have space for dust-to-dawn beds. It's equipped with commercial washers, dryers, um, kitchen, dining room. It, the owner has uh, added solar infrastructure to it. It's uh, close to transit and retail jobs and has a regional East Mesa location. This is a map of an overview of where it's located. It's located off the Superstition Springs Circle. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, Southern Avenue's to the north, Power Road's to the east, and the US 60 to the south. It is close to uh, Valley Metro bus routes, as well as bus stops. And it does have a park and ride at the south um, part of the mall, near, just north of the 60. And in addition to having the right property, as well as providing valuable services, we of course want to be a good neighbor in the work that we do here. Uh, much like at our current location, we would not have walk up traffic, so this is a referral process, again, through mainly through our police and park rangers. We would add fencing to delineate a secure campus with a block wall, and um, no hanging out in the parking lot is allowed. We do have police presence on site at our current location and would plan to do so at this location as well with twice per day visits to every room, um, as well as we, we plan to have clients driven off campus to receive services. So we are not trying to create a campus um, like you see in Phoenix with CAS, and we are not trying to duplicate services. We're really trying to have this be um, one point of contact for shelter, and then they would receive services at other locations. Uh, trespass enforcement for surrounding businesses, as well as more community outreach and engagement um, to really allow the community to provide input and additional suggestions for the good neighbor policy. A clean and well-maintained campus and a community line for nearby businesses or residents to provide input or ask questions. So our next steps, um, if we move towards uh, purchasing, we would provide a letter of intent to the property owner to show them that we have interest to acquire. The types of dollars that we're using for the property does require an appraisal um, and a review appraisal. Once those are received, we will set just compensation, which cannot be less than the value of the appraisal. Uh, we'll make an offer to the owner, uh, preferably in person, and then we will enter into negotiations. If the purchase price, if we reach an agreement, uh, we will enter into a purchase agreement and bring that back before you.
So council, this is, we're early in this process. And what we wanted to do tonight is bring this forward for your review and consideration and to give us an indication if we should continue forward in this process that Kim just outlined. So we're asking for you to direct us to continue forward with the necessary steps for due diligence. We need to look at how we're meeting federal requirements for these dollars and potentially to, if we're successful, enter into negotiations to use rescue plan funds to purchase the sleep-in hotel. And as Kim just noted, um, if all of that is done and, and it's approved tonight, we plan to come back to city council with an update, probably in the fall. Mayor Council, so this is just the beginning process. It would be multiple times for us. If we get the green light to continue, we'd probably come back with more, you know, talking about the security and what they look like. We're, we don't have a full agreement with, obviously, we don't have the appraisal, we don't, we have an interested seller, we don't have a, an agreement, but we just want to kind of deliberately walk this process through. Um, so we would be coming back to council. This is not a decision today that makes a final decision. It's just an opportunity for us to keep walking because we're going to spend resources and uh, we've got a seller who has an expectation. So we just wanted to start the conversation with you tonight. Great. Thank you very much. Council, questions on this item? Mayor, I have a question. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, Natalie, and thank you for the presentation, all three of you. Um, as far as current uh, current things that we're doing with the, uh, the, the hotel that we leased today, is basically we're just transferring that over to this new asset, correct? That is accurate, thank you. Okay, so all the monies that we contribute today would, would again go over to the new asset. The thing that, you know, I, I don't think the city should really get into the asset business. However, the conundrum for me is that if we don't have a lease with a hotel like this for our homeless situation, then we have a really worse situation than we would in the future. So uh, I'm in support of this uh, moving forward personally because I see the good in this that will come. We've, we've done a very good job in managing the current lease and and I know that the homeless individuals that we do serve today are very appreciative of it. One thing I don't think you mentioned, maybe you did, but uh, how many actually graduate from this program and move forward to where they actually leave the cycle of homelessness and become self-reliant. That might be something I'd like to know in the future. But again, I'd like to just me uh, as council member move forward in, in the process. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mark. I think we're all saying the same thing here. It's 74% of 777, yep. right, to answer your question? So, Mark, uh, Councilman Freeman, I think on slide four, I think we're pulling it up. Um, I'll let Irma or Mike do the math on 74% of 777. But it's, <laughs> it's a high percentage, right? And you said something, yeah. Councilman Freeman, that I think is important. Um, we're not intending to this to be an expansion where we're adding additional beds. This is replacing what we have. We're, we're not uh, suggesting to Council that you know, obviously, there is some thought that more beds would be better, but we recognize too, we're trying to keep this program kind of in the context of what we have today that serves us well. So I think the number of rooms we have today is, that are 85. Available is 85. So we're not adding additional rooms for the off the streets program because we recognize that can create, you know, we've got a lot of operational issues that we have to manage. We want to make sure we can do that very well and continue doing that well as you see the success of the current program, this is just trying to come up with a permanent location so we can, can continue to provide the successful service. So we would again terminate, terminate the lease with the current hotel provider uh, sometime in the future, like what, in a couple of years? Natalie, did you say that? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Freeman, what we would do is once we have secured an asset, we would work on a transition plan and we would do that with our current operator, Community Bridges. And so that timeline and those details are still to come, but yes, what our, our purpose in this is basically to take one program that we already do and move it to a completely new program and to do that in as seamless a way as possible. 
and that's what I support. I, I wouldn't want dual assets or mm -hmm. dual responsibilities. So, thank you. Thank you. I know Ms. Spilsbury had her hands up. Um, I, this current program is in my district and I'm actually sad to lose it because I've heard really great things from the neighborhood around it that, that um, crime has gone down and that it's safer with the police presence there. And so um, I think it's um, incredible what we're doing. I think it's money well spent. I think um, it's filling a need that we have. Um, I think this location is good. Um, it's kind of tucked back a little bit. You can't access it from right off of Southern. That mall, that mall parking lot's huge. Um, very familiar with the area. So I, I think it's a good place for it. Um, this is 100% ARPA dollars then would be used to purchase. And then do we incur any city expenses with this? So the, the goal is we, we have to go through the process and we need to get the appraisal. Um, I'm sorry, Council Member Spilsbury. So what we hope to do is use 100% just to purchase the asset. And what we're using for the operations are other coronavirus dollars that we have that are disposable that are through the CDBG program. So then um, a nonprofit would run it still just like currently. Yes. We would just Community come. Bridges is yes, our partner. They're our partner. We would bring them, they would with come us. with us to this location. Okay. Um, but to your point, with the ARPA dollars, as we all know, there's a defined amount that has to be spent within a okay. specific period of time. So that's why we're anxious to kind of move this along. Over time, the operations costs will continue to be ultimately either from the city's general fund or through maybe some federal dollars. But that's going to happen regardless, right? If mm -hmm. rather, what, regardless of which location. The idea is here, if we make the investment in an asset, we're not paying a lease for the next whatever, 10, 15 years, right? So we have that. that. That's where we've been. And I think we should also mention that Natalie and Kim have been looking for a location for the last several months. I can't mm -hmm. know how long you've been looking since we talked to council about this. And, it, and it's been a challenge. So we've, as council, kind of direction of trying to look further east for you know spreading the services out. So we were looking east of Gilbert Road, and so anyway, this is what we end up with. This is the one that came uh, up available. So. And those, um, the hotel rooms that we are leasing, the price has been going up and up and up, right? So that's one of the reasons why we're wanting to do this, to try to... Yeah, so over time, the prices have started to go up. And um, so this, you know, owning an asset would give us the ability to basically cap that cost for the... For the public tax dollar. And then I'm assuming just as we discussed with those two new leaf properties, if this was to be sold in the future, the money would go back to the government, uh, the, like the profit, oh. or how does that work? I, we'll have to, like we don't know. Making, we don't know. No, <laughs> we, but I, knowing the federal government, we won't be pocketing yes. the money. Right. for. So it's not like we're doing this to make a profit. No, a, a we're not flipping properties. We are intention to continue to provide these services. Okay, so I'm, I'm also in support of this project. Okay, thank you. Other comments? I guess I'll be the, probably be the lone NIMBY on council. And, um, and I do have concerns. Um, one is because this, this mall and the surrounding area have been in decline for several years now. The, the mall has actually outlived its life expectancy by several years. And um, I know that economic development myself have met with Mace Rich several times to re-energize the mall and the, and the surrounding area. And so I hate to see um, something of this nature come into the area when we've been working so diligently and hard to um, reinvigorate the area. What I don't want to see happen is another um, Fiesta Mall fiasco where we end up spending millions of dollars in surrounding properties and so forth trying to rejuvenate an area because it declined to the point uh, where you know we had to put millions of dollars into it. And I think this is one of those things that, that will happen in the same manner. Um, I also, you know, the police presence on site, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, twice per day visits to every room, I'm cool with that. The trespass enforcement, um, I don't understand how that's really going to work. I mean, I, I drive the area right now, and there's homeless people all along Southern Avenue. Um, they're hanging out in the Walmart parking lot. They're hanging out in the Taco Bell parking lot. And there's not a single officer that's out there patrolling to trespass them. 
unless I text um, or call the lieutenant, and then he'll dispatch someone over to, to, uh, to enforce uh, trespass. And so I'm not sure that the, the trespass enforcement of surrounding businesses is actually a real thing, um, unless somebody actually calls to complain about homeless persons hanging out on their prop property. Um, I just, I struggle with this in the bigger picture of I don't know when it became government's job to take care of homeless people. And for some reason, that has shifted onto local governments to do. And it's, it's sort of like, you know, your fire department all of a sudden became responsible for medical calls. And now the majority of our calls are medical calls versus fire. And, and I hate to get into this business because eventually it's gonna shift over. And if CDBG dollars go away, it's the city that's funding this. And um, again, I just, I don't know when it became government's responsibility. And the fact that homeless people in our community seem to have more rights than our own citizens when it comes to park space that they've paid for, but yeah, we can't evict somebody out. And I know that the, that the law, the, the law in Idaho, <clears throat> or the Ninth Circuit's decision on the law allows for um, homeless to camp in public domains if there's no place, uh, if we can't provide shelter for them. And again, I don't know why it's government's job to provide shelter for homeless people. And the fact that our own citizens can't enjoy their park space that they've paid for with their secondary property tax um, through bonds and so forth um, because the homeless people are there and, and homeless people take priority over our own citizens. And I don't get that, I don't support it, and I won't support this project moving forward either. All right, thank you. Mr. Luna. Uh, I'm gonna be in support of this project. I think it's a great project. Um, we need to spend those ARPA dollars as soon as we can. So uh, work hard, get this property, and hopefully council will be in support on purchasing the property. Uh, and Scott Butler back there has, I've told him, we gotta spend, because Congress might take these dollars away and we don't want them to do that. So um, time is of the essence. Do it, work as hard as you can to get secure this property. Thank you. Other comments? Um, I, I, I too am in, in favor of this, uh, of going forward with this, I think. Any of us that have traveled uh, recently, you know, California certainly, but even anywhere, you know, Texas, uh, back east, uh, tents are ubiquitous in, in public right-of-ways and encampments, uh, and not so much in Mesa. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, the Boise Ninth Circuit decision has been referenced, and and we do enforce urban camping laws in Mesa. And the, and the reason we legally can do that is because we can, we're can we providing emergency shelter. So uh, I think the Off the Streets program has been very successful. And I, I express my appreciation to the police department and, and these ladies and others that uh, have done such a great job. 74% uh, of 777. Someday somebody will tell me what that number is. 575. <laughs> so yeah. That's, uh, and, and uh, I heard you say, you know, 20% of those were children and a high percentage were seniors. So uh, I'm proud of that. that that's, uh, thank you for doing such a great job. Um, the facility in East Mesa that this has been conducted at, uh, it's been exemplary. We, we, we have not had problems with the neighborhood. We, there's a very high and intense police presence there and, and there's been a, a good neighbor policy that's been enforced. And so we are pretty good at this. And, and so the, the idea is not to come in and uh, and be a burden to the the Superstition Springs Mall area, but but to to, to locate this and uh, there won't be people walking. You know, people don't show up at our doorstep here. They, they, as the slides indicated, when services need to be provided, people will be taken in and out in vans, and you know we'll do our best to uh, to have uh, continue a good neighbor policy. Um, so I think this makes good financial sense, saving money over time. If we, if we don't. A lot of other cities have done this already, and so this is a tried and true way to save to, to spend this money. Uh, you know, we don't have to worry about it being uh, taken back from the federal government, and it also sets us up. I mean, I, I think we're all a little bit nervous. What's going to happen when the ARPA money runs out, and, and uh, a lot of these services that we've been able to provide uh, start coming out of the general fund, and so this is a good way to hedge against that because we'll be able to have a, a an asset that we for 
maybe, you know, decades to come, we can say uh, that was one of the legacies of, of our ARPA money. Uh, so for all of those reasons, uh, I'm supportive of this and look forward. Uh, got my fingers crossed. I mean, as everyone has indicated, this is at the very early stages and a lot could go wrong uh, in this process. But uh, I appreciate staff uh, coming to us with this idea and uh, look forward to getting more information about it. Uh, Mayor, oh, just kind of quickly say, I think we, we, in, I appreciate council saying this, but I want to express my appreciation to the staff that you have here in front of you, Aaron Rain and many others, because we wouldn't even be able to have this conversation if the current office streets program wasn't working today, right? We wouldn't want to replicate it if that was we're, that was problematic and it was becoming difficult. But because of Aaron and Natalie and many others, it's been so successful, right? Almost 600 individuals have successfully been placed because of this program. That's why we came to council and said, listen, this is, we're, in this, we're in this whether we like it or not, and so if we're gonna do this, let's do this so that we can do it for the long term. Acquiring an asset is a big deal, but my goal is to set something up so that no one really knows we're there, right? The goal is not to be a shining beacon here, it's to be nobody really notices that we're there. So we've gotta think, if we can be successful in acquiring this, the goal would be we're the best neighbors, we have security, police officers are around that area, so we've got a lot of work to do, but that would be our goal. Thank you. All right, thank you. Vice Mayor. Yeah, um, sorry, I should have made some comments earlier, but I'd also like to point out that this isn't a permanent residence for people coming into this program. It Typically, how many weeks or, or months is the so process? Mayor, Vice Mayor, we try to keep people under 90 days. Um, during our time period, there have been some that have gone a little bit longer, but you know, like we've done with this program from the very beginning, we keep making it better. Every step of the way, we figure out what we can do and how to do it better and to be more seamless. And so this is one of those areas, but our goal is within 90 days with maybe a few exceptions based on you know, critical cases or disabilities. Great. So when you think about that, in 90 days, we're having a 74% success based on our program that we put together over COVID. So we're impacting thousands of lives, possibly in a year. I mean, at least 2,000, because I assume we will be able to maybe be more robust as we have learned more about the program. And um, I, I, I think I commend Aaron Rains, his entire department of housing, everybody has come together for this. I know you've been working hard and trying to figure out how to integrate with community bridges and other services in order to make the difference in people's lives. The cost of housing is astronomical now. I don't know how people even afford a one bedroom apartment. I really don't. Um, it, it is just, there are so many homeless that are have full-time jobs. now. We all think the homeless we see are everybody. It is a subset of those who aren't tucked on, under, behind, in a car, in an RV, whatever. That little bit of helping hand to get them on the way to a life that is a, the quality of life we want to provide to all of our citizens is what we need to do as a human being, as a government, as a nonprofit, as a residence in Mesa. This is a village program. I mean, we all are involved in this. If we have compassion for another human being, another citizen of our city, we have to make these programs, these choices in order to help people. Um, they say 40% of bankruptcies end up homeless. And it's usually due to medical reasons. Medical reasons is 40% of the bankruptcies and, it, and they end up homeless. And huge percent, almost equivalent of aged out foster. They don't, they get out of the foster care system. They don't have a wage in order to support themselves. They have no support as far as family. It goes on and on. It's across every demographic. I can't say enough about it and I'm saying too much probably right now, but I am tremendously in support of this. I think we're making great progress with this and then making that transitional housing and, and, and graduated and making the difference in lives and people. I'm very proud of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. 
All right, I think uh, you have uh, approval to go forward. I look forward to hearing, hearing more from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item 2C on our agenda for this meeting is uh, a presentation and to provide direction on proposed changes to the Mesa zoning ordinance regarding drive through facilities, outdoor eating areas, temporary use permits, and potential topics for future changes to the Mesa zoning ordinance. Rachel and Nana, thank you. Mayor Council, good afternoon again. Um, we do have three presentations. Just to give you a little bit of background, the number one, item is the outdoor eating areas. This is actually building up on the successes that we experienced during the pandemic when council actually signed and allowed those outdoor eating areas. Through that experience, we realized that it's something that is really helping businesses and it's something that needs to be done in the city. So we are proposing few changes to codify and allow those to continue. The second one is the temporary use permit. We realize that um, currently the code restricts the number of temporary use permits and that has become strenuous and our recommendation is to really streamline the processes and also allow those to allow temporary uses that happens in our city. And the third one is a drive through as we've had several conversations and this is also direction from some of the council members as to the excessive drive through um, basically spreading out all over the city and sometimes it poses certain challenges so we want to make sure that we address those. So with that, I'll pass it on to Rachel. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, council members. So if you recall, Nana and I were before you in March to discuss some of the proposed um, amendments to our zoning regulations regarding drive throughs So we're back here today to present some of um, the revised concepts with you, but also talk about these other couple topics that Nana just mentioned as far as outdoor eating areas and temporary use permits that we anticipate will be coming forward at the same time as our drive through reg regulation amendments. So the first one of those that I'll go over tonight is the outdoor eating areas. So as Nana had mentioned, um, we saw you know a, a huge success with the the proclamation and the resolution that mayor and council passed during the pandemic to allow for outdoor eating areas through the Mesa Alfresco program. So with that program, um, that allowed us to administer administratively approve outdoor eating areas, um, and through that assisted about 52 businesses, and it uh, resulted in the reinvestment in about $26,000 in uh, Mesa businesses. So with that resolution that is due to um, either expire or be rescinded soon, we're looking to um, make some text amendments to continue on with that success and increase opportunities for outdoor eating areas to reduce some of the, the bureaucracy about obtaining that. Um, but with that as well, um, looking at ways to enhance the aesthetics and the regulations surrounding those areas. So currently in our zoning ordinance, um, outdoor eating areas require either a special use permit or an administrative use permit. And that really depends on which zoning district they're located in. Within the downtown district, there was an approved SUP that, um, that allows for outdoor eating in the downtown pedestrian overlay. So that's already kind of been covered for the downtown area. Um, but once again, we want to try to allow that in other places and reduce some of the barriers to that. And then also currently in our development standards um, for outdoor eating areas are very limited. And so in a sense, it, you know, it made sense that we required an SUP or an AUP to try to, to try to address any sort of potential impacts that those might have on surrounding properties. But with our recommendations, what we are proposing here is to allow outdoor eating areas in all commercial districts by right, and then to refine those development standards to better guide those operational and um, development standards surrounding outdoor eating areas to try to address any sort of potential impacts head on so that you're, there's no question about if it's gonna be an impact to surrounding, surrounding businesses, surrounding residential um, uses. So jumping into temporary use permits, this may be something that you've never heard before. Um, so I'll kind of go over what it is first. So a temporary use permit is an administrative permit that gets approved by the zoning administrator. So it allows for certain temporary uses um, to be conducted on a limited duration. 
And the point of this is to allow those temporary uses that are not um, a permanent use on the site, where we know that they're not gonna have, they're not gonna alter the character of the site, they're not gonna have permanent physical impacts on the site. So currently um, in the zoning ordinance, it is very narrow. We only have two uses that are allowed to apply for a temporary use permit. And those are swap meets and farmers markets. All other sort of temporary uses currently get processed through a special events license. But with that, there are, um, there are regulations about how long they can occur. So they can't exceed four consecutive days or four times per calendar year. And if we do have a use that wants to exceed those limitations, what we end up doing is having to take it to the Board of Adjustment and process it as a special use permit. So as you can imagine, that's a pretty timely process. That's a couple months in the making, um, pretty burdensome to those, to those businesses or citizens that wanna conduct a temporary use. So we're creating a kind of middle ground by trying to expand what sort of uses can be incorporated within a temporary use to bridge that gap between the uses that really only occur a couple days per year um, to those that really need to go to a board of adjustment for kind of a longer duration. So we're trying to create a middle ground there that will reduce some of the bureaucracy involved in it. So our goals for this are to, to address some of those procedures and the guidelines to really improve the efficiency um, for temporary uses, to reduce the barriers for those uses where they're appropriate, and to really clearly define um, what specific temporary uses are. So what we are recommending is to expand the temporary use category to include other uses such as Christmas tree lots, haunted houses, firework stands, parking lot sales, and these are just a couple of examples of what you might see as a temporary use. And then within that, we would be refining the timeline that they would be permitted for. So currently under the zoning court code, it's very broad and just says they, they can't be conducted more than two years. Um, so with this, once again, trying to make the distinguishment in the middle ground for the temporary use permit. So there would be two different kind of scenarios, one being a temporary use that's um, operated consecutively and then others that might be of an intermittent um, duration. So things that only operate on the weekends, every other weekend or once a month. So with that, we're proposing a couple different um, time frames. So for the consecutive operations, that would be 90 consecutive days. But with that, they'd have the ability to ask for a one-time 30-day extension through the zoning administrator. If they wanted to exceed that, they would then have to go to the Board of Adjustment to request a special use permit. For those uses that might be just occurring kind of intermittently, um, it would be 180 days total, um, but they would also only be allowed to operate two days a week for those. So that, for an example, would be more appropriate for say a farmer's market or a car show where they pop up every weekend for a couple months. And finally, um, we'd be refining the approval criteria and the operational standards. So once again, trying to address some of the impacts and have those built in to the regulations beforehand to make sure that um, they're not detrimental to surrounding properties and residences. So can we just pause here for just a second? Because sure. I think you've all lived through some of these, right? So especially the farmer's markets issues. So Without this change, the farmer's market wants to come in, it becomes a much more complicated approval process, right? And we've all experienced that, and that created a lot of complications. So this idea that we're trying to really simplify that, while at the same time putting some boundaries around that, the idea is, you know, if it's consecutive, it has a certain limitation. If it's during the weekends, but uh, it's only the weekends and we give them a certain limitation there. So we're trying to create this balance between before this becomes a um, special, uh, yeah, special event, yeah. right? So that kicks into that category, which is a whole nother level of scrutiny and licensing. Yeah. So anyway, that's, I don't know if you want to go through all of these or because they're going to be very different topics. So I don't know if you want to stop here and then no, before I, we move on to the next I like, one. I like what your, your suggestion, Let, let's do take it a bite at a time. Okay. Mr. Thompson. I, guess, I have a question, I guess, on the, the temporary use permit. So 
Like we see on occasion, we'll see those, and, and this is really talking for the parking lot sales, I guess. When you see those roadside um, salespeople that all of a sudden pop up and they're selling dogs or they're selling flags or they're selling pottery or whatever it is, how do we regulate them or do we at all? Mayor, Council Member Thompson, I, th I think that's going to depend on if they're in the right of way or if they're on private property as well. Well, I'm guessing like um, a Christmas tree lot, haunted house, fireworks stand, parking lot sales are all private property anyway. Right. So would that still be considered, um, I, I guess it would be private property. So would they, would you allow them somebody to sell dogs off the side of the street for 90 consecutive days with an ability for another 30 day extension? Yes. <laughs> but most of what we see, I think you're talking about, the examples you're talking about, are on the corners, right? It's the cat well, cat towers and whatever. Mm -hmm. So those are right, you're typically in the right of way up or at least close to it. Is mm -hmm. that correct? So I don't know, Jim, help us out here, but I, don't, I think that's not what we're talking about here. No, Mayor and Council, those, anyone that would want to do anything like that would need a peddler's license anyway, and we can regulate it through the peddler's license. To do that, so this just gives them. This is a little. This gives the opportunity for some of the more routine type things to happen. But a peddler's license right now would allow you to do some of the things that you mentioned already. Okay, that that's what I was looking for. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Are you regulated? Yeah, through peddler's license. Okay. Correct. But yeah. someone's going around checking to see if they have one. Absolutely. I mean, that's if we get a complaint, then oh, they can call and we can confirm it. I don't know that we have peddler's license enforcement. Officers. Actually, we do. We have oh. license enforcement of four people. There you and, go. And and we do we we do routine inspections. I mean, we have four people to cover the whole city. So, but we do our best to try to get out there. And we watch the uh, social media and the Facebooks and all that kind of stuff and and, and, and internet type activity. And then we try to go out there and check on those to make sure that they have them. And especially if we get a complaint, then we definitely go out and check that out and make sure that they've got a license and they've got their TPT license as well. Can I ask? Please. Were you, are you done? Uh, Mayor, Mayor, question. Sure, uh, Mr. Freeman, you're right after Ms. Spilsbury. Um, I was just wondering, how does this compare to other cities around us? Have you done the, that? Yeah, analogy? Mayor, Council Member Spilsbury. So the temporary use permit is a very common um, process amongst many cities. So, us compared to other cities, as I explained earlier, it's pretty rare to see such a limited amount of uses that are eligible for temporary uses. And they have very comparable timelines. 90 days is a very standard time frame. So we're moving use. closer to mm -hmm. what's typical versus we're being pretty we're constrictive right now. Right. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. So my question is about the zoning of the parcel. If the zoning is LC or AG, does that play into the temporary use permit? How does that work? Mayor, Council Member Freeman, so it would need to be a use that would be allowed in the underlining zoning district. Oh, for example, can I use myself in this example? Uh oh. The, the, uh, I have to, code enforcement is sitting here, Mark, so <laughs> if you want to, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I have a farmer's market on an ag zone parcel. So does that mean that the market that I have today would have to do it to UP. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Freeman, so, so with this we are kind of grouping these into broader categories. So that's part of our consideration is going through the land use charts and taking a look at where these would be allowed. And so there would be some expansion of, of where these would be allowed. So I think I have an exemption now you're great. Or having an ag. But I'm just saying broad broad base, any any zone parcel, depending on how it was zoned, whether it's ag like like commercial or other, would determine the type of use permit that the individual would need. Mayor Council, I think, Council Member Freeman, that's a good question. But one thing we also need to recognize is we'll be reviewing this. So as part of this, we will be looking to make sure that if there is any temporary use that is coming to a location that is going to be, tra there's going to be traffic, we will review that to make sure basically it's a place that you can 
monitor and manage the traffic, other things that may be associated with the use, and if it cannot be mitigated, then we will not be approving that temporary use permit. All right, I'll stand by for further information. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Luna. <coughs> uh, Rachel, just clarification, the 180-day total duration for two days a week. What was the previous to that? So currently in the zoning code, temporary uses, it just says no longer than two years. Okay. Uh, you know, I had a situation at Red Mountain Community College. Uh, do you remember, Tim? They had a farmer's market. Um, they were having a lot of challenges with the city. It wasn't a bad thing. It was a good thing. Uh, and uh, so would then they be allowed to, to go ahead and do that? Mayor Councilmember Freeman. Um, Councilmember Luna. Luna, I'm sorry. <laughs> We, Tim and I are very familiar with what you're talking about because I spilled over to another case that I think is better not to mention, but that was the challenges that they were having because they were using the special event permit, which only allowed it to happen, for, I think, four days. four days, and you can only have it three times in a year. So because it was a good thing, but the code basically restricted them. With a temporary use, that's something that we could have looked and allowed them to be able to operate within a well-structured um, system. So if they come back and apply, they can get a TUP yes. instead? Of, no. That's correct. Okay. Well, they how, can do it 102 yeah. days for 180 day totals. So how are you educating the community and letting them know, hey, that's the wrong way? Are you telling them, Tim? Or we, will you... we will certainly, and I'm sure zoning will as well, but we will certainly be highly involved in that. Okay. We, now we still have to go, what's the process? Are these? Uh, Mayor Council, we still have to go to Plan and Zoning Board. We've done a community meeting, so with that, we're also going to inform, you know, Tim, true Tim, the community, all the things that you can basically do. So we're just starting, we Sorry. are going to PNZ and then we'll come back to Council. Okay, okay, great, thank you. I have a, Frankie, yeah. go ahead. Not on this, but uh, on the outdoor eating areas, is that? But if I was about to, to ask a question about Is outdoor eating areas, so go ahead. All right, so if uh, so, we're saying that uh, any uh, commercial district will be allowed to look into creating some outdoor eating spaces, right? That is correct. So, Mayor, Council Member Heredia, so it would be a permitted use, but they would still have to go through site planning review, right. and there would be certain kind of criteria built around that that they'd have to adhere to as far as with the sidewalks, where they can be located, encroachments. Okay, so that would be the process. That's my next question. And then are we thinking uh, also it's looking at some of the specialized areas? Like I'm assuming downtown, um, there could be other areas within the city where uh, it could be further incentivized uh, to look at outdoor uh, eating areas uh, in the future. Is that something that through our, our, I don't know, our planning process, looking at how do we encourage, because uh, the next item is our drive-throughs, right? Uh, and so how do you add value if we're limiting uh, drive-throughs, how do we add value to pieces like the drive-up windows and outdoor eating areas? Uh, to give options to businesses to encourage that kind of uh, development in, in, in their restaurant or, or uh, ret retail space or that they serve food in. So, Council, I think that's what we're actually trying to accomplish okay. here, right? Is now we're opening. It was very limited to this downtown and just other downtown, areas. Yeah. Now we're saying everybody, all commercial. So I think that's the incentive. Now we're removing the bureaucracy, the review. Well, the, the permitting, we're allowing for it now. We still have to do some site review. Sure. But I think we took this as, hey, we used it during COVID. It was successful and, it, and businesses seemed to thrive on it. Why not just keep it going? And so that's really, I think it's exactly what you're saying. We're trying to create that value now sure. for restaurants. And I think what we'll need to do is continue to work with them on the standards. That How does that work? Especially mm -hmm. more in the retrofitting of existing uh, restaurants. Uh, yeah. But I'll also encourage that with new Sure. Yeah, figuring out the designs and the it gets pretty hot uh, as we're counting right yeah. this summer, and so it, it's not about just adding a table and some chairs outside. It's about safety and ensuring that residents are feel safe out there outdoors eating. So, all right. Thank you. 
I think you answered my question just now because I, I under the alfresco program, I think we were very lenient during COVID as we should have been, and I think some of the eating areas actually extended beyond you know the actual frontage of the business, which was fine. It all worked out, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, going forward, maybe that shouldn't be the the tried and true policy. You know, you can be in front of someone else's business or in an alley not adjacent to your business. So those those factors will be uh, considered as on a case-by-case -case basis or, 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 or can you? Yeah, Mayor, so th those are some of the development standards that we're recommending to to build into these text amendments. Yeah. Okay. Is we had very basic ones already for outdoor eating and it's just to really refine those and to provide better direction on kind of the parameters and the design of it as well. A, a, a similar situation, I think I, I, I've heard Sometimes folks will come in and say, hey, I, I'm, I'd like to get a permit for a festival or a farmer's market or something in the public sidewalk in downtown or another area. And they don't necessarily have any relationship to the businesses that, I mean, they're, they're trying to schedule the, the sidewalks of, in front of brick and mortar businesses, sometimes on a very frequent basis. And that would be detrimental to those brick and mortar restaurant or uh, businesses. Yeah, and that is, that's another topic we need to you're right, Mayor, and I think we're trying to address that in those specific areas where that's a concern. Okay. That, so that I have some kind of permission or con from the yeah. business in front. Yeah, we'll work on that. So but we're this, working on that. Okay. This is really trying to encourage the outdoor seating that we allowed during COVID and continuing that going forward. Okay. We're running short on time, and I know you're not done with your presentation, so why don't you... Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. You know, I have to ask about this. So uh, downtown took advantage of this, of course, there's quite a few businesses. Even today, I was down on um, uh, in downtown over the weekend, and a couple of businesses are more, even as hot as it was, there's more people outside using the patio area and choosing to sit there than inside. You know, there'd be empty places, but it'd be packed outside. So it really is a lot of fun and adds a lot of activity and, and you know, to our downtown. So for those businesses who had made those patios d through the Al Fresco program, now what is the next step and does it apply to the bars or is just, this is only mentions dining? What is those, what are the next steps? Are, will there be just a transition or a reapplication? Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor uh, Duff, so we would be going through a process basically to legitimize those on a permanent basis if they wanted to keep those areas is what the process. So it would just be an administrative site plan review to get those final approvals to, to legitimize it move, moving forward so that there's no question if it was ever permitted. So they wouldn't have to apply again, pay any permitting fees, or would it be no, a... They would have to go through at least this next standards that we're going to set on the administrative okay. side. But we're not doing anything to them right now until we have those standards in place. Okay. So there will be eventually a formalization mm -hmm. yes. of this and where there are going to have to be an application. There's going to be certain standards. But, you know, we're hoping that the success of what we've seen downtown and other parts of the city, we're going to build that into the standards. Okay. But the goal is to make more of a transition of that Absolutely. type. Absolutely. Yes. And, and to allow it throughout the city, encourage right. it throughout right. the city. Exactly. Exactly. I know a lot of businesses depend on that and would like that. So that's great. And so we have to go through all these text amendment changes on the ordinances. So what is the horizon on that? Is it? Mayor Council, so one thing I just want to add to this is really streamlining and making the process easy in terms of cost. This is also going to be way cheaper than going through the SUP because the temporary use permit is cheaper in terms of the actual money you pay and even time as wise as well. So this is more cheaper. And then we're also going to be working with Tim as well to really make sure there's better coordination. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please proceed. All right, so I'm going to move on to drive-through regulations. So Steph was directed by City Council to take a look at our drive-through regulations. And um, the intent of that was really to address some of the impacts that we've been seeing regarding um, kind of the density, the, the number of drive-throughs coming into the city, and the clustering of those. 
So the goals of that is really to protect our urban form and the character and image of the city, but also to preserve the integrity of those neighborhoods surrounding those commercial centers. To give you a way of example, I'm gonna show you a couple site plans that we see um, very often coming into the planning division. And staff works very hard with council members currently to try to work with the developers to come to a solution to address some of these, these challenges that we see with these site plans about the number of drive-throughs that they want to install. So before you was a group commercial center, we have some very high-end uses in the back, such as hotels, gyms, but you can see on the arterial frontage, we have six proposed drive-throughs. So that would be what you would see driving down your, your main thoroughfare there. Um, that provides a lot of challenges to that commercial center. That one is the image that you're seeing, our drive through restaurants. Two, it creates a lot of um, kind of traffic impacts to the rest of that center. So it makes it very difficult to, to circulate and get to those other businesses, makes the visibility of those other businesses kind of limited. Um, another example here is on a smaller scale, um, you can see smaller kind of commercial development, but once again, completely dominated by auto-related uses. And on the right, I'm just showing some examples of what that looks like when you're driving down the road, seeing just drive-through after drive-through. Um, and really, is that the image that we want to set as a city? So as you can see in this example, we have on the left on that site plan, there's five drive-throughs, but also a car wash there. Then tucked in the back, there's a grocery store that, once again, very limited visibility, a lot of accessibility issues for, for reaching that. Within our current regulations, the, the process for allowing drive-throughs is really mixed depending on the zoning district you're in. So in some zoning districts, it's permitted by right, others require a special use permit, and others require a council use permit. With our regulations currently, there's no limitation on the number of drive-through businesses that are adjacent to one another or in a development. Um, and we also don't have any distinction between drive-through uses and pickup windows. So something that we had discussed at our last study session was really making the distinction between those two because we do recognize that the impact of the two is, is different. With drive-through lanes, you have a lot more idling because you have the menu ordering board, you have the speaker box, whereas a pickup window, such as what you see with pharmacies or banks, you're driving up, doing your transaction and taking off. You don't have a long you know, stack of cars piling up. You don't have noise from any sort of menu ordering box there. So as staff, we are defining differently pickup windows versus drive-through lanes. And we would be treating those different with these regulations, these proposed amendments. Um, what we are recommending is for drive-through lanes or drive-through uses facilities is to prohibit those in the neighborhood commercial zoning district. And if you remember when we talked about the intent of these districts, these were intended to serve those immediate neighbors there, really to give them those goods and services. They're supposed to be walkable for you to go and kind of meet your daily needs. Um, we're re also recommending to require a special use permit in the limited commercial zoning district. And these areas, they serve a little bit of a, a greater um, trade area but they're still really intended to be low intensity service oriented businesses. It's not supposed to be like the general commercial where it's supposed to be more intense um, retail oriented, auto oriented. So what we um, are recommending as a set of base standards and parameters as we had discussed with um, council last time we expanded on some of these and I'll, I'll say beforehand that these are the base standards that we're proposing, but with this, we would be building in flexibility. So if an applicant came in and wanted to exceed any one of these standards, they could do so, but it would require the approval of a council use permit. So there's a series of, series of these that I'll go through that we have developed to try to address all the various scenarios and the, the density and clustering of drive-throughs. So the first one would be that no more than two drive-throughs could be located adjacent to one another. So this is try to prevent what you saw in that site plan where it's drive-through 
drive through drive through just back to back. The next one would be where you have two drive throughs adjacent to one another. <laughs> you can't locate another one within 750 feet of either one of those two that's already there. Um, next one would be that you would be allowed no more than two drive throughs in a group commercial center. And then finally, um, to address our intersections, um, no more than two drive throughs at the corner of intersections so that you don't have your intersections dominated by drive throughs. So before I move on to the timeline, is there any, any questions on that? Ms. Pillsbury? I'm just, I'm just gonna make a comment. I, um, I appreciate the um, differentiation between the pickup window, windows and the fast food. I guess is fast food the only thing that then is a drive-through? Or is there anything else that would be, what? Well, banks are a pickup window, they said, and a pharmacy would be a pickup window. So you, I think Rachel said it's a order, it's an order, order menu, it's a right. voice, it's... The distinguishing would be the order menu box, the um, order menu board, or if you had an employee out there physically taking orders, like you see at a lot of these Which coffee shops now. Which would only be fast food or... I'm trying to think other shops, than right? fast food, what else? Um, Dry clean? No, I don't think they. About a liquor store. Liquor stores? I, I don't you know have what else. Some, I know there's like a water and ice that you can drive up to the window, right? Like there's like a door that you drive up to and they put water in your car or something. So I mean, Right, but if there's not this menu and this ordering process, I think that's what we're trying to mitigate okay. against. So the two drive through regulations at an intersection or in a commercial center would not include pharmacies or banks or ones like that. Those would not include the pickup window uses, that's okay. correct. I just, again, as a mother with a ton of little kids at one point, didn't want to get in out of my car, elderly people, people that are disabled, drive throughs are wonderful through COVID pandemic, we saw drive throughs got us through. So I, I don't have this problem in my district and I can appreciate that other people do have this problem in their district. I've never ever had one single one of my constituents reached out to me complaining of this. <laughs> so um, I have a hard time making these strict of um, regulations when it's not something that I'm seeing. I'm wondering how many, do we have a lot of, I'm sure District 6 does, has a lot of areas where there still could be drive throughs being built. But currently we have intersections all over the city that would um, not fit this, right? And there, I mean, once it's, once it's there, it's there, right? There's nothing we can do about it retroactively. Mayor Council, those that are existing, those will be classified as non-conforming, so those are, will be allowed to be there. But there is also a lot of redevelopment that is going to be happening. We've started seeing some, I think Council Member Freeman can attest to that, there are a couple of them in his district. And without having this in place, we won't be able to at least review this in a way. So. One of the things is we definitely want to look at the fiber of those neighborhoods where in certain neighborhoods those are not the right fit and in situations where we believe that it may be a fit. There's so there's so a process. They will have to come through the council use permit and the council member will be able to also have conversation with them as well as the neighbors as well. So that's basically what we're For an exception on one of these. Yeah. And then I, I brought this up when we talked about it before, but so um, all along baseline is Gilbert on the other side, or we might have spots where it might be a county island or something. We're just, we're not worrying about their city, and so would it still be two, even if we only have two corners of that intersection? We're very worried about the town of Gilbert, but that's what <laughs> we can do about it. <laughs> but I mean, what I'm saying is if we're saying two drive throughs at an intersection, that's typically four corners. Yeah. So in those places, we would only have two corners, and we're still going to go with two. We're not limiting that to one because it's half the intersection. This is like my whole district down baseline, <laughs> so I'm just curious. Mayor Council, I know Jim is looking at me, so <laughs> for, for now, we think we look at what is within our jurisdiction and not what is outside our jurisdiction, but maybe Jim can add to it. Still stick to the two. Well, we can't. We for can't, half of an intersection. They're not coming to us, right? I know that. I'm just wanting to make sure we're not going to apply any stricter rules because it's only half the intersection or something. Oh, uh, well, we That's probably what would saying. be. We would be. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what their rules are. <laughs> so, yeah. Whatever our rules are, it apply to Mesa. Okay. 
I just, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Mr. Thompson. I love this, <laughs> obviously. Um, you know, this really came out of um, a couple of issues we had in District 6. One was, it used to be District 6, it was Hampton and Signal Butte. And, um, and that one took us a year of working through a development agreement because they kept dropping um, fast food restaurants. And in the first round of uh, submittals they had, six drive through restaurants on one property. And um, we kicked them out of the office, told them to come back. The same developer ended up buying at Signal Butte and Elliott and dropped five fast food restaurants, um, drive through restaurants at that location. Once again, we had to kick them out and tell them to come back, you know, go back to the drawing board. And so it, it, it becomes a reoccurring theme in District 6 when they buy you know, a parcel of property, all of a sudden the low hanging fruit is a McDonald's and a Burger King. And so in District 6, we have McDonald's and Burger Kings on every single corner of every major mile street. And it's like enough is enough. We have to, we have to do better and we have to, you know, make sure the developers aren't picking the low hanging fruit and that they're, that they're pushing um, quality uh, that, our, that our citizens um, deserve. And that, um, I would be okay if those didn't even come to District 6. I'm talking more about like restaurants that you would see, um, you know, at Stapley, you know, yeah. um, you know where you have the, the nicer, higher end type restaurants. And unfortunately in District 6, we're not getting those. We're getting mostly the McDonald's and the Burger Kings um, and the occasional Whataburger. Uh, which everybody was really enthused about, but um, but the fact that you don't, you know, when you get out into East Mark and, and you get out into Bellevue and some of the farther neighborhoods, there's zero amenities out there as far as restaurants. I mean, the, the nearest nice sit-down restaurant is, is Chili's at Baseline and Signal Butte, and how many times can you eat at Chili's before you get tired of it? So we're bleeding revenue into um, Queen Creek and Gilbert because everybody from from Cadence and Eastmark and Bellavia and everywhere else in Southeast Mesa is going to those communities to eat at their restaurants. So thank you for putting this together. I love it. Francisco. I think uh, other than the neighborhood commercial, we're, we're not, we're adding an extra step for folks to, to apply for drive throughs right? Like it's not, other than neighborhood commercial, we're, we're not allowing them, uh, which do we have a lot in, in neighborhood commercials anyways? Um, Mayor Councilmember Heredia, we, we don't, but it doesn't mean it wouldn't happen, especially as we're going through a lot of redevelopment and revitalization. So that's why the neighborhood commercial, that's not an intent. But um, to answer your second question, the last time we had this discussion, and I know I've had this conversation with several of you that at least you want it to go through the council use permit so the council member in the community will have a say in those drive through unlike the current requirements where it's allowed by right. So they come in and basically do a side plan is allowed. And so I, I think by allowing this, I think we're actually giving more voice to the community to uh, voice their opinions uh, because there's gonna be an extra added process to not just having a drive through being put there without any notice, right? Uh, I actually, I, I feel like it's a, it's a, an opportunity to interact with uh, the neighborhoods a lot more with neighborhoods and, and communities uh, to ensure that we, we have a process to have at least a discussion if, it, if it's uh, the right uh, feel, look and feel for that neighborhood. So I, I'm very supportive of, of this initiative. Um, because we, we do, in, in my district, in West Mesa, it's a lot of redevelopment piece, and we do get a lot of fast food coming in as far as redevelopments. And, and so it, I think it's important to have at least a, an opportunity to have a discussion rather than just allow for that, for that use, right? With, it doesn't provide any discussion. It's just allowing that to happen, right? So uh, that's... I think an important process to take note uh, on this change, so. Uh, I have a question. So you would draft these changes. Would they then uh, maybe be vetted by P&Z? 
and then come back to council? Mayor, council, that is correct. We've also had a neighborhood meeting. We also did meet with a development advisory community, um, committee a couple of months ago. So that's correct. We'll go through that, go to PNZ and come to council. So, so maybe if I can go over the, this slide here. So, so we had a public meeting on the 29th. We, we did meet with PNZ back in March as well to discuss the drive through regulations after we came to council to discuss it with you. So we are planning on finalizing these draft amendments throughout the summer here and then going to planning and zoning board in September and then back to council here for your recommendation or action in October. Okay. Thank you. Uh, given that we're going to have a couple more bites at this apple, I mean, I think uh, you got some good feedback here. We're about almost 45 minutes over our time for starting upstairs, so why don't we just uh, agree to continue this discussion and hope that the feedback you got was useful to you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Moving on, the next item on our agenda, item 2D is to discuss and provide direction on the candidate to be nominated for the position of city magistrate from the candidates who completed the interview process in February. I know we're all familiar with that process. Uh, is there a motion to uh, nominate one of those candidates to be placed on the August 22nd council meeting agenda for the city magistrate appointment? Mr. Thompson. Mayor, I'd like to nominate uh, Yomayog Novell to the uh, new magistrate position. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And I'll second it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Billsbury. We have a motion and a second to uh, move uh, Yuma Oak Novell to that agenda on August 22nd. Is there any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you, that motion passes unanimously. Judge, I hope you'll pass that on to uh, hopefully our future magistrate. Uh, next, uh, item three is to acknowledge receipt of meetings. Mayor, uh, just quickly, just on that item, it'll come back to the council for formal action when we come back from the break. This is just recommending the name as if we, like we've done before. So you'll have the opportunity to formally recognize this uh, in a council action. Thank you. Right, yeah, so that, that, that uh, vote was to put her on the, on the agenda for the Correct. August 22nd Correct. meeting. Yeah. And uh, assuming that's successful, we can swear her in and, and celebrate that. Uh, item three on the agenda for this meeting is to acknowledge receipt of minutes, uh, meeting minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Thompson and Ms. Billsbury. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Item four is current events and conferences attended. I know I've seen you all be very busy this last week. Anything you'd like to share with us? I'll say a couple of things. I, I had a, the opportunity uh, on Friday to go to the viewing for Mayor Gail Barney, who uh, our, our friend and mayor of Queen Creek uh, that passed away last week, and it, the funeral was Saturday. And uh, Mayor Barney was a great friend of Mesa, and uh, he was so involved in the creation and the development of, of Queen Creek. It's uh, it's really that, that's a huge loss, not just for Queen Creek, but for the the, the East Valley. So we. Ex ex extend our condolences to Mayor Barney's family and to the entire uh, city of Queen Creek. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Luna, happy birthday. Uh, hope you have a happy day. Um, also, another uh, another thing I've noticed. Dinner at 8 p.m. tonight. Dinner at 8 p.m. tonight, yes. Well, he, you, you celebrated with your family a day or two yeah, ago, didn't weekend, you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it can't go without mentioning that this is our assistant city manager's last uh, council oh, yeah. meeting. Mr. John Pombier yeah. is well known to everyone in this room. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Pombier, Pombier has had a wonderful career at the city of Mesa. He, he started here back in 2003 as our city prosecutor. Uh, did a great job at, as the city prosecutor. Won multiple awards for Mesa's prosecutor office as being the, the prosecutors of the year. Uh, so much so that... that uh, he got Mr. Brady's attention, and, and shortly after that, he he spent the last 12 years as our assistant city manager, and and really uh, had some very challenging. <laughs> yeah. Somebody upstairs is in a lot of trouble, boss. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, he's had some difficult assignments. He had been being in charge, as you know, uh, the majority of our budget is public safety, and, and Mr. Pombier has has done an amazing job of really. Uh, 
uh, being a champion in our relations with our police and fire department and sustainability and some other very critical departments. So, Mr. Prombier, on, on behalf of, uh, well, I think we'll, we'll have a, a couple of opportunities to express our appreciation to you, but we want you to know that, that you'll be missed and that we really appreciate the amazing service you've given this community. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Vice Mayor. I have a, a couple of comments. First of all, I'm wearing my water use it wisely shirt to commend um, on the consent agenda tonight our campaign for water use it wisely and it's uh, not a, a very important time to address how we can do that and I look forward to the campaign and engaging with the community on that. Um, I wanted to say congratulations to Mayor Giles for being recognized as Phoenix Magazine's uh, great 48, I saw that in, in my magazine, so congratulations on that. And congratulations to um, City Manager Chris Brady. <laughs> Wallet Hub ranked Mesa as the top managed city in Arizona and 20th in the nation. Wow, and, Holy uh, <laughs> we have some work to do, but I'm proud of the work you've accomplished so well, far you. and I appreciate your leadership yeah, and, you. and, and accomplishing that, so thank you. Thank you. You're right. We, we should have mentioned that. That That's uh, quite an honor. And so yeah. thank, congratulations, Mr. Brady, and congratulations to everyone in this room that made that possible. Other, uh, anything else you'd like to share with this council? Mr. Freeman, um, anything you'd like to share with us? No, sir. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. If there's nothing else, Mr. Freeman, uh, Mr. Brady, what does our schedule of future meetings look like? Two things, Mayor. Uh, good news is we don't have to do this again until August 18th. That'll be our next study session. But I also want to take an opportunity as we um, say goodbye to those who served us very well, and we've and John has certainly done that. We also want to congratulate congratulate Miranda, who has now been promoted to our government relations director. So that's a promotion for her. So congratulations. I know council knows how valuable she is in helping us with so many things at the regional and state and federal level, and we appreciate that she's willing to step up and take this uh, new position. So congratulations to Miranda. Uh, let me just second, second that. Miranda, you've done a great job this yeah. last legislative session, and, and we're fortunate that, that you're so well prepared to take on that very difficult responsibility. So congratulations to you. Uh, Council, anything else? Is there, if not, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Luna and Mr. Thompson. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. We'll reconvene in just a, a few minutes upstairs.